What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Triple Play Fantasy Baseball Show. We got a bonus episode for you guys this week, so it's not the normal shenanigans, all this crazy stuff in the intro, wasting five minutes of your guys' time here. We got a, a fun subject today. You know I'm joined by Marty, a.k.a. Marty Party, as we are now going to call him on the streams <laughs> here. That's going to be his new nickname. Did I did I do okay with that, Marty? Is that an exciting I like it. Um, it's, you know, considering anything that it could have been, I absolutely love it. Plus, it reminds me, it reminds me of Mario Party. So who doesn't love that? That's exactly what came through when I did it. There you go. Got our friend Jasper <laughs> hanging out on the stream with us. Got Doc here. How you doing, buddy? Doing good. Doing good, man. You know, uh, always down for a Mario Party reference. And, uh, you know, now now maybe teach the FBI started. Maybe we'll get some actual baseball yeah, started. You always, you always ruin the tease for me. Uh, Art, okay, a little cheesecake here. How's it going, man? It's good. I, uh, I, I hurried, uh, hurried the kids out. I don't know how my <laughs> youngest son got pasta sauce on his oh socks, God. but, uh, I don't care. It's not my problem anymore. <laughs> uh, I mean, that sounds Someone pretty messy is, there. It's pretty, he's, he's a messy kid. <laughs> <laughs> And then we got an open stream tonight. It's an hour-long TGFBI stream. So our first guy is hanging out with us tonight. You guys know him. He's everywhere these days. He's at Pitcher List, Dynasty Nerds. He's over <laughs> Fantasy Pros. And, of course, Triple Play Fantasy. You guys know him. Christian Crespo. How's it going, man? It's going good. How are you guys doing tonight? Good, good. Uh, happy you could be our first guest on the stream. We have a few guys going to be popping in. It's just a oh, yeah. come in, hang as long as you want. We're here till 8 o'clock tonight. We're basically doing one thing and one thing only and we are talking the great fantasy baseball invitational draft prep so we're going over strategies we're talking everything that goes into prepping for arguably the best baseball event that goes on in the fantasy baseball community tgfbi is like a celebration a party every year draft day is something everybody's posting their picks all throughout twitter it's it's a holiday pretty much and so we felt like hey on the eve of it let's just do a stream Let's hop in and let's talk about it, how we're feeling, you know, maybe where we're leaning for certain picks, if we feel comfortable putting that out there, or just overall draft strategies and just ways we're, we're looking to attack this compared to other formats. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share on screen for you guys, this is just NFBC ADP, and what I have it set as, and I want to shout out Vlad Sedler. If you don't know who he is, then please don't talk be to under me. a rock. Yeah, don't don't talk to me if you don't know who Vlad is. <laughs> but he basically put out a tweet I think everybody should know that's in TGFBI. He outlined it beautifully. He said, if this is your first year competing in TGFBI, he said, one, make sure you set the draft dates as far as recent drafts from about two to three weeks out from today. So I have it set as three weeks out. This gives you more recent data and how people are drafting. Number two is he said set it to uh, for it to be draft champion style as far as the drafts that you're following. And why is it that specifically? Um Oh, God, I was watching the latest Call of episode as y'all came oh, up. Oh, yeah. Jasper's yeah. the man. Jasper's Jasper the, man. the man. Shout out Jasper's oh, yeah. right here. Um, but, uh, yeah, so you basically said it's a draft champions as far as the format, and that is because it is the equivalent of what the TGFBI format is. So that way you can see how players are drafted in this format compared to other ones you might do, like draft and holes and so on. And then we have it out here for you guys to see. And we're gonna talk. We're, we're gonna go through kind of just how we're approaching the big day tomorrow. So enough of me talking, Marty. How are you feeling about TGFBI tomorrow, dude? I am so excited. Like we we've done a, a couple different draft and holds in the DCs and everything like that. But there's something special about TGFBI. Everyone posting. Everyone's gonna be posting their picks and everything. And I have a really good league with Baffleet Crazy in it, Bogman from ITL, uh, Christopher Clegg, you know, from, um, you know, everything that he does, fan tracks, everything, and just about five other guys who are apparently really good. So I'm super pumped, dude. Yeah, uh, your league, I thought it was the League of Death, but I'm pretty sure Christian is the one in the League of Death. Aren't you Christian in League 16? Uh, yes, the one with um, Carlos Marcano and Eno and Jeff Treya and all those guys, yeah. That's me. Man, the luck of the draw. Uh, it's all right. I got Matt in there with me, too. Well, oh, Matt, good one. Triple, yeah. Yeah. Little triple, triple babe. Yeah. Um, how are you feeling? It's your first year for TGFBI. How are you feeling for it? It is. Um, I have done absolutely no prep for it because I heard that if I overthink it, I'm just going to drive <laughs> myself crazy. So I'm, uh, I'm going in there. I'm just going to not wing it, but, you know, I'm going to go in there with a, a, a little strategy and just 
see what falls to me. I mean, I got the eighth pick, so not too bad, but you know, it's uh it's gonna be exciting. I'm excited. I think with the eighth pick, it's really good because you'll be able to avoid any potential runs as far as like if you're at the end, if there's a yeah. run of closers, you'll be kind of in the middle of it to be able to not miss out. I think which is the best part yeah. about being able to Definitely. draft in the middle. Have you you don't have to reveal who you're looking to pick, but do you have in your mind one or two guys that you're expecting to to look at at that pick? Yeah, I've narrowed it down to three people, three okay. people that should be there when I go to draft. So we'll see. All right, LC, you're now a grizzled veteran. This is your second year of TGFBI. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you you have? I believe we both have the fourth pick. Yeah, and you've been very public in our group chats, which we don't have to reveal. What you know, who you're picking. There is no doubt in your mind, right? Well, I it it, it depends. I think that this draft has a clear top four uh, power speed five tool guys that that. Um, that you can go after. So I think if you're going fourth, you're going to get one of those four. It, and so for me, it is clear that my top four hitters, um, Trey Turner, Fernando Tatis, Jose Ramirez, and Bo Bichette. Uh, I'm expecting Bichette to be the one there, but uh, you know, who knows, uh, as you can see on the screen ahead of us, uh, Bichette's gone as high as two, five or six different guys have gone top overall. So I'm not even sure I might have two of those guys available to me at the fourth pick. Um, and so that's why fourth was my top uh, KDS choice. And I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty stoked about that. Yeah. And like you said, I, I have on screen the NFBC ADP since February 6th. So it's three weeks from today. And this is kind of how you see it shaking out where there, it seems like there's a locked in top three. And since obviously it's Roto stolen bases are more favorable. You see, Jose Ramirez being the third player taken here. I believe earlier in draft season, he was going closer to like six, seven, eight. So he's really shot up recently over the last month or so. Now he's a, a bona fide top three pick. I'm going to ask you, Christian, since you have the eighth pick. And then, uh, Marty, I'm going to ask you because I believe you have the sixth pick. Is that correct? Seventh. Or seventh pick. So I want to hear yeah. both of your guys' opinions. If you had the fourth pick, assuming the top three are gone, where would you go at the fourth pick? Um, I would have uh, definitely Juan Soto for me. Juan Soto yeah. would be your fourth pick. So you're taking, yep. skipping over Bichette, Cole, going yep. Soto. Okay. What about you, yeah, Christian? I can see him. I yeah, mean, same. yeah, I just, I think 12, uh, 12, 15 stolen bases is something he can get you. Obviously, we know the ceiling with home runs. He, he's one of the best players in the world. I don't have to, I think like Bo Bichette's kind of a reach there because you're just hoping he's going to get you all of those stolen bases. And I don't know if he's going to be able to get you as much runs as he did last year. So for me, it's Juan Soto easy. Uh, the, the one thing with Soto I'd say this year is that since that lineup really isn't that strong, how much running is he actually going to do? Because you figure he's going to be put in a spot to really drive in the runs as opposed to, you know, getting on base for guys behind them. I mean, he'll still have Josh Bell, but for the most part, I, I don't really see him running too much. I mean, yeah, he could still steal you 15 bags, um, but I just think it's everything else that he gives you too. It's, it's like, his on base skills are elite. He's going to hit for power. He's going to score runs. I mean, he's going to drive in the guys in front of him. Like, it, there's no doubt. I mean, he's one of the best players in baseball right now. But yeah, he, he would be definitely be my number four. So, looking what? at Bo Bichette on fan graphs, they project him. You have zips, 25 steals. The Bad X has him at about 15. ATC projects him for 21 steals. Uh, do you guys looks like most people are projecting him anywhere from like 15 to 25 steals that stolen potential stolen base upside doesn't maybe sell you guys more than Soto. And especially where stolen bases are kind of at a premium here and people are looking to get bona fide steals at the top. Does that not tempt you guys? The thing for me is that I just feel he's safer, especially that early in such a deep league. Like mm -hmm. I just want somebody that I know I can trust right there. And don't get me wrong. Boba Shed is a great talent. But, I mean, there's always the if he can do that. Like, if he could steal the bags, if his bat will be consistent enough throughout the year, which there's no doubt in my mind he can do it. But at that early in the draft, to, to have to wait so long until my next pick, I'd rather get that guaranteed player mm -hmm. than, you know, take that shot. 
Well, let me you. ask you guys. Doc, and I want to real quick, Doc, and then you would cop. Definitely need help of first uh, stream, first TGFBI. Congratulations, first TGFBI draft. That's always exciting. If you have specific questions as far as for if you know what I mean, if you have specific questions as we go along here you want to ask us that we can try to help you with, please let us know. He's drafting second behind the GOAT, Al Mel Melchior. Uh, so, friend of the pot, Al Melchior. So, uh, look, Doc, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off here. No, this he, ties into it he, perfectly. I was going to say, he's going second. I'm going second. So, yeah, so you, Doc, you're hoping you get Trey Turner. Exactly. I put I put my KDS as one because I really want Trey Turner. Um, I think that's – I'm not going to say safest because mm -hmm. baseball is different year to year, but it's someone I'm hitting defense. in a good lineup multi-position eligibility will hit for some pop some speed get a lot of counting stats now if he was gone who would you take at number two i mean i'm still going fernando tatis did anybody differ on that yeah, either fernando or jose i, I would follow so, that so so that's that's where i think the discussion is because right now i'm leaning towards jose ramirez obviously third base being a little bit more shallow for tatis the main thing with me is the injury I mean, mm -hmm. what updates do we have on that? Slash, do you think, let's say we play a full 162, how many games do you think he actually plays? I think the um, over-under is at 140 for me. I think That's how many games we're going to play this year, so he might play every oh. game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, Go ahead. I think you, I th but, yeah, I think 140 would have him missing almost a month's worth of games. Um, so – but we saw last season he played about 130 and still hit 40 home runs and stole 27 bases. So I think it's a he's just he's just the best player, and the injury is really the only reason mm -hmm. that I think that he's not number one overall. Now let me ask you guys because I can ask you all this because nobody has a back end pick in their draft. Looking at this ADP, if you have let's say the 15th, 13th through 15th pick, so if you're somewhere in like this range. Are you looking to go pocket aces? Are you looking to grab two hitters here? Where do you guys think your strategy would lie if you were picking in the last three picks or so uh, in the, in a TGFBI draft? Let me start with you, Elsie. I I want to get Ozzy Alves, um, although I think he's probably going to creep up. I don't think he's going to. He might not be there in a lot of drafts come 13, 14, 15. Ozzy Alves is my is my top target at that range. And then I'm going to get a pitcher on on the on the swing around. So you're looking Walker Bueller, Brandon Woodruff, Max Scher, probably if I know you cheesecake, you're probably going Brandon Woodruff. Yeah, Woodruff would be my top target as as on the wraparound. What about you, Marty? If you have a back end pick, where would you kind of look to pick? Where who would you I, pick? Yeah, so I would hope to see Mookie Betts there. If so, I'm taking him. If not, Trout, and then so I'm going to go hitter pitcher. So one of those guys, and on the back end, either Bueller or Scherzer. Okay, so you guys are each kind of one on one. Christian, what about you? I'm going double hitter. Ooh, I'm I'm hoping Robert is there for me as one mm -hmm. is a five category contributor, uh, for sure. I mean, there's no doubt about that. And then if Mike Trout is there, that's great. But if not, honestly, I would take the shot at Devers. Uh, between Especially him with having, premium. yeah, exactly, third base in that spot. I don't think that's a terrible spot for him either. I mean. At the turn, he, I mean, yeah, you're you're passing up those aces there, but I think there's such good value in kind of like that second tier of starting pitchers, where there's a couple guys that I would be totally fine with being my SP one. What do you guys think of? And it's a strategy that's I don't think talked about enough, but it's something that I've I've heard many high stakes players use. It's called the ABCs. Is everybody familiar with that? Because of you, yes. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, so. It's called aces, bases, and closers. And what it means is your first three picks, you get your ace, you get your hitter that hope usually will give you some type of steals, and then you get a closer as your first three picks. You're able to get your ace pitcher, you're able to get your a uh, good steal source, and then you get an elite closer. Is that a strategy you guys would use or you consider to use in a draft like this? Let's uh, I'll go to you, Doc. Yeah, so I think you definitely have to read the draft. And us being in five different leagues, we know that we're going to be comparing all the time of what players are going at a certain pace. We'll probably be complaining about whose draft is slow compared to others. I do think, you know, it's interesting when Phil Dussault put out some of his draft strategy, 
And I think him going closer second, third round or two closers in the top four really pushed up the significance of it, especially these being 30 as opposed to the DC 50. I do think that those are important categories you need to go after early. What about you, uh, Christian? Would you go the the ABCs route or is that something you you are not touching because of you don't want to close that early? For the most part, for me, it's just a closer position. I mean, obviously, you have the, the top guys, top four guys, I would say, in Hendricks, Hayter, Iglesias, and Class A. That's kind of where, like, that's one grouping for me. Um, but I just think the position is so volatile that, that I would rather just take the chances later on and pick up those guys and kind of, like, street like get the one the one really solid closer that i know has a hold on the job that'll get majority of the saves but then just kind of like stream from that on that's kind of the approach that i took in um in the triple players ball uh i locked up class a i think in the fourth or fifth round because closers were flying already by that point um and then i waited a little bit before i got guys that i felt would get majority of save chances in their pen and that's kind of the same approach that i would take well, we have somebody that might be able to help on this topic. We've got our buddy Cubby Noel checking in on the stream. How are you doing, man? Hey, man. What's shaking? Just had some Chinese food. It was delicious. Well, oh, the important thing is, what did you order? Beef lo mein. Beef lo mein? I don't, I don't know if I can get behind the beef lo mein. That's, that's I'm with little... it. I'm with it. Nah, I, I'm like a spicy chicken type of guy from there. Uh, But all right, so... Cubby, I got to ask you, we were talking about closers and how much they're pushed up right now, especially if people want to get them in like the third round. Do you think that you will go and get your closer potentially early tomorrow? Or are you not buying this huge bump up for the relief pitchers? Yes, David. I, he, very good he, he, he wrote to me and he said his connection right now is unstable. Okay. So, I'll, okay just like so the I'll, closer market. I get it. Yep. <laughs> oh. Silence says everything. <laughs> uh, Elsie, I didn't ask your opinion on it. What, are, what were your thoughts about it? I mean, I think it's a, I think it's an interesting strategy. I, I, like five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I've, I've not done it yet. Um, but uh, you know, with with the the narrative and and with the uncertainty in the market, it is almost, it's something I would never do. But this year I'm considering it. I'm not sure if I'm going to go early. You know, Hader had 102 Ks in 58 innings last year. That's that's not really hurting yet too much. And there and uh, Hendricks had an amazing year as well. I'm considering it. I mean, I, I'll I'll be fourth, so I'll be coming in the back end of the second. Uh, it's possible, but I mean, you never know. They the top two might be gone by then, and so that's the, that's the other part of it. You might not have a chance. You might not want Iglesias in the third. You might not want Classe in the third. It's interesting. I don't know if you guys realize. I, I, I heard it today when they were talking about it on rates and barrels. Two closers are in the top 10 pitchers. Like that's that to me is wild that they have it two is. closers inside the top 10 overall pitchers, which just says about how much people are pushing up, especially those two guys. Uh, Cubby, are you with us? Oh, I, I long to hear Cubby's voice. I'm, I'm anxious to hear him uh, while well, he's still figuring out. I, actually, actually, I think I'm on mute. Can you hear us now, Covey? Yeah. Yes. You sound wonderful. You look great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. It's this, this will get you anywhere with me. Uh, and sir, David, your check is in the mail line. Yeah, there you go. Uh, Covey, what are your thoughts on this, this crazy bump for closers? I, I'm really curious to see how it shakes out tomorrow in a fab league because I've only done DCs and mm. obviously it's much more sensible to do it there with with no fab no replacement but i don't think i can jump on board um in rounds like two or three but i think once iglesias goes that'll kind of be my nudge to go ahead and grab grab one soon after so i'm perfectly comfortable grabbing one you know a jansen even though he's boring he'll close somewhere mm -hmm. i'm comfortable grabbing a, a closer by round five or six in years past i wouldn't but it I mean, you guys know it's so absurd these days. Who can we trust? Seven guys, eight guys, tops, nine, maybe? It's ridiculous. So I don't mind just grabbing something that's so scarce and not worrying about it later, just like we do with speed and aces. Well, right now we see Ryan Presley going around pick 46. 
I think that might be where the the I mean, Chapman. That I think he's very much divided as people who feel comfortable taking him and don't. Then you got Jansen, and then you got Will Smith. Where's the drop off for you, Christian? Where's like if you don't have this guy, at, at, like at this point, where are you starting to freak out? As this is your top relief pitcher. Yeah, if I don't have Presley as my top closer, then that's when I start worrying a little bit. Okay, um, so the drop off. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he's kind of the last guy I feel comfortable with because honestly, I feel like Chapman, he's going to do what he did this past season where he'll probably be dominant the first month and he'll blow up for two months and then it'll just be shaky. And then you don't know where Jansen's going to sign. And last year was actually one of his best years. He really improved, um, especially the use of his cutter and whatnot. Like all of his metrics were incredible. (laughs) Um, but just the uncertainty of where exactly he's going to sign, how he's going to fit in the role. He's going to be a closer, but it just depends on the team and the usage and whatnot. But yeah, Ryan Presley's the last like secure um, closer that I feel like I can, you know, the last one available. Are you in the same boat there, Marty? Yeah, and I, I completely agree with what Cubby said as far as the strategy because it there. I mean, there is fab, so I'm not as I don't feel as pressured to have to get a for sure 100% closer throughout the year. You know, there's going to be tons of closers that pop up. They're going to get you 15, you know, saves by the end of the year that you can hopefully secure. That being said, I do not want to chase them the whole season. So for me, the big once Will Smith that that's my cutoff where I got to really and you know, I want to get somebody. Uh, before the Will Smith. Now he's not going to be able to help your ratios out too much. And he's not overall necessarily the best pitcher. So, you know, a Tyler Matzik or a Luke Jackson, you know, to kind of be his handcuff, you know, later Mm -hmm. in your draft is something I'll be thinking of, but Will Smith's where I cut it off. I just can't wait till week one of fab till everybody blows their money on like a Julian Merriweather. I did that last year. I won't do it again. (laughs) You learn your lesson. Speaking of relief pitchers, the man, the relief man is here. He's coming there in from go. the bullpen. What's you up, make it, You make it sound like somebody's going to shit themselves when you say the relief <laughs> man's coming in. <laughs> Let me check oh. and see. I'm, I haven't yet, so not today anyway. So, Oops, I crapped my pants. <laughs> <laughs> it's never too late for that to happen. No, that's true. Uh, Doc, we were just talking. I mean, again, as we were going to close out the topic of relief pitchers, you're the man. You are you speak relief pitcher. What is... Where are you comfortable grabbing your at your RP one? Where is the drop off for you? Boy, that's a really hard question. I, I, I don't see myself doing what a lot of the other guys have been doing, which is grabbing the double tap of the Hendricks hater or second round closer. I just I feel like there's just too much volatility there, even for guys that supposedly have the job. Right? I mean, mm-hmm. that's a huge. If you miss there, that's a huge miss. So. I've really been, and and what I've been thinking is kind of targeting that second tier, if you will. Like, I'm pretty comfortable, I think, getting a guy like Presley or a guy like Romano and, and, and as being my number one guy. Now, I know there's going to be risk involved with anything that you're going to do when it comes to the relief pitching market, but I'm honestly okay with waiting a couple of rounds and not doing the. I mean, I've seen I've seen Hendricks going like 15, 16. I, I think that's insane. You know, personally, <clears throat> the way you're passing up on to get those guys is just crazy. Wait, one more minute. It's, yeah, the, uh, the volatility is just, I mean, you don't know, right? I mean, he could be as good as what he was last year, but what if he's not? What if, yeah. what if Tony La Russa somehow decides, and, and God only knows what's going on in that 77 year old mind, right? <laughs> what if he, de- what if he decides, oh, you know what? <laughs> Let's flip flop him and Kimbrel. They keep Kimbrel, and all of a sudden Kimbrel's the closer, and you wasted a second round pick on on Hendricks. Like it's a scary proposition to me. Yeah, well, they also just spent um, a ton of money on Graveman. Kopech could definitely be used as a closer as well. Um, so they've got plenty of options. And Tony Larusso did not fear <laughs> away from you know not using Hendricks in the ninth inning at times when he had Kimbrel there. So it's. It's kind of like a crapshoot. Um, I got a question for Mike, if that's okay. Oh, but it, you know what? It's more hey, than hey. okay. <laughs> hey, where do, where do you jump back in? Like, just as it's hard to decide, you know, you're, when to jump in on your first closer. I mean, jumping in on the second closer is probably just as a tough proposition. Like, I keep finding myself with Taylor Rogers or Blake I, Trinan. I, I love it. I love Taylor Rogers. I, Trinan's a little risky to me because I still think in my heart that Kenley's going back to L.A. I, I just don't – I don't see – him moving cross country to go to Florida or anything, you know, I just don't see that. 
And so I feel like Trinan is a little risky. Now, Trinan is actually obviously very good for your ratios, even if he's not closing. But I, I'm speculating on guys like Rogers. I think Rogers is a 30 save guy waiting to happen if they just leave him alone. Um, I really love David Bednar and Pittsburgh too. I mean, I, I know that there's a lot of question about him with Stratton and somebody today said Richard Rodriguez is might be, be kicking around there again, but he's better than both of those guys. I think, um, Lucas Sims is a guy that I'm targeting mm -hmm. a lot too, in the middle of, of the group there too. I really think that, uh, his numbers, if you take a deeper dive into where he was last year, uh, I think he's another 30 save guy waiting to happen too. Now, that being said, he's also got another really good guy in the bullpen there, uh, statistic looking wise, with Art Warren. So yeah, there's the risk Art of Warren. <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a risk with anything you do, but I think Sims really has the pedigree, and I think that that I would I foresee that being the case in Cincinnati. But who the hell knows? <laughs> <laughs> uh, just want to acknowledge the comment here from uh, guys, one of our our friends here watching the stream. One of the best parts about when you have so many people is like we have different. Mike is is the relief pitcher whisperer. So having his insight on that specific category can really help you, especially where those like guys that he just identified as later targets to grab too. So if you miss out on the, the initial run of relief pitchers, you can find other guys there. I'm very curious because I want to get to another position that's relief pitcher obviously is talked about a lot, but third base is also talked about a lot as far as the drop off at this position. And if you don't get a certain guy here, are you just going to wait and try to pair two guys later on in your draft? Now, LC, you look at the third base position. If you don't get well, first, my first question is where's the drop off for you? And are you making it a priority to try to draft one early? Or are you basically in your mind? Okay. With drafting guys like Josh Donaldson and, you know, drafting the guys like Matt Chapman and, and uh, you know, the candy man or like, are, are you okay grabbing those guys later as your starting third baseman? If I'm if I'm stacked everywhere else, I'll go with Candelario or I'll go with I'll try Donaldson. But I'm I'm trying to get. I, I think that the top three there's a definite cutoff, and, uh, and the draft price shows it after Machado. And then I kind of I kind of skip Mondesi because he's off my board. But I think Riley and Arenado. I think Arenado is probably one of the best bargains in the in the entire draft, especially when you consider his position and where he's going. So our Ar Arenado is, is to me, you know, when you say, Oh, the, the third base position stinks. If you, if you're, if you have your targets, you can, you can leapfrog for an Arenado. I also, I also kind of like when you get into the mid one hundreds, there's a run of Turner, Urias, Ryan McMahon, who I also would be perfectly happy to go with as my third baseman. And they're going in the one forties, one fifties. A Turner's even in the 160s. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And again, for those that might just be tuning in, this is NFBC ADP since February 6th. So these are the basically the 24 most recent drafts that are done over on the NFBC as far as draft champion style, which is the format closest to what you'll be seeing for TGFBI. Yeah, uh, I just want to piggyback off him. I'm I'm with him. Like the, with the top three, if, personally, if I don't get any of the top three of Macho, Devers, or um, who's the other guy? Freaking getting all the kids. Yes, sorry, I'm an idiot. <laughs> yeah. After the top three, it's up, guy. After the top three, I'm I'm probably just chilling to like the likes of Justin Turner and even Donaldson. If Cabron Hayes' injury history wasn't a thing, uh, he's more interesting because of his profile, so unique for third base with the potential for ten to fifteen steals. But like, I do like Arenado, but I don't know. He's just so kind of boring these days. So he's <laughs> he's okay going there. But he's pulling the ball as much as he ever has. Now that he's at a cores, he's kind of has to. So I think the average is probably never going to rebound, which is expected. But I don't believe I don't trust Riley. You know, if he regresses to two seventy with power and no speed, I can find that profile later. I don't I don't need it to be my fourth pick in the draft. So if I don't get a top three third baseman, I'm just I'm just going to chill for a while. I mean, one position has to be your worst hitter, right? So <laughs> can we talk about? how much injury risk there is at the third base position. Like you look at Mondesi four, that's a huge injury risk. Alex Bregman coming off wrist surgery at the seven ranked third baseman. Chris Bryan is at his own health issues. Rendon coming off hip surgery. DJ LeMayu groin surgery. I think Cabrian Hayes. surgery, yeah. Yeah, Cabrian Hayes injury of his own. Like it's a very much position that's up in the air just because you don't know how healthy these people are going to be. Or what I, I, feel, I feel like 
there's still pretty decent value in it though especially now with the universal dh mm-hmm. like one guy that i targeted in i know who you're gonna say i'm gonna go to him while you're talking let's see let's see if you got it no right above him yeah long ago. Ah. evan longoria evan longoria last year prior to him getting injured was on almost a career pace like mm-hmm. to his old tampa bay rays like days he was absolutely mashing the ball it's in the water in over there in San Francisco, because every old guy that goes over there just mashes. It's incredible. I need to I need to get um, over to San Francisco then. <laughs> yeah, trying to, trying to take a trip over to the bay. But um, another thing, and might seem like a joke, but for the Adalberto Mondesi's, um, for that situation, um, I don't know. I, this morning, I actually thought of this. Now that they're not testing for steroids. Somebody as injury prone as him, what if he kind of takes advantage and watch him not get hurt this year? Mm-hmm. That would be whoever and got like, Adalberto Mondesi. That's what I'm saying. Whoever got him eight rounds later than he probably should have gone just got the best value of the draft. Yeah, and even if he only plays 100 games, if you pair him with somebody else, you might be able to get by, right? I mean, if you if, if you, you pair draft... him with an Evan Longoria and pick 336, I mean, that's that's incredible. I mean, even if he plays 100 games, he could still win you the category outright, right? I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, if he plays 100 games, he, could, he might still X. 60, right? <laughs> right, exactly. So then the question becomes with Alberto Monzi, who right now is going around pick 48, where are you comfortable taking that risk? Like, are you comfortable taking him in the first three or four rounds? Not no. for me. No, I'm not either. I'm not well, either. Especially, especially when you have the, I think it was the GM coming out and saying how, you know, we're going to try and uh, keep him health be, healthy by like monitoring how many games he plays. So like picking different yeah. times to sit him and stuff like that. I don't, I don't want to hear that first out of my fourth TGFBI, pick. FBI, I'm freaking going for it. <laughs> i love it i love it i'm taking all those guys all the injury risk guys i will take them because half of them have to pay off and if half of them pay off, you put them all together in one i got a full season worth of great stats so, so you're here. talking you're, christian's going adalberto mondesi justin verlander noah Cindergard, byron buxton <laughs> byron buxton hell if we find out the season's delayed i'll do the same thing <laughs> yeah if i could get hey first let me start off with acuna if i could get him and then I'll go ahead and I'll take the rest of the risks. No, but honestly, with Mondesi, Jacob Degrom, second round. Jacob Degrom, I would double tap pitchers. There you go. Pick. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but no, I feel I just Mondesi is such a great talent. Like I just wish he would stay healthy. His two biggest runs have been in September, though. His two biggest runs of his career, the ones that like everyone goes, you might get this from him. It's like. Great September's where he just piled yeah, when he's up finally healthy. Him. He's also facing AAA players, and so like he's he's piling up stats against bad players, and you eat so much garbage the first twenty weeks of the season mm-hmm. with Mondesi, where he's hitting. He was hitting. Let's let, let's take uh, twenty twenty as an example because I have the stats to mind. He was hitting one eighty nine heading into September, he brought his average up to 257 and stole 24 bases in that month for the C or something like that, or or 15 of his 24 bases in that one month. It's like, and in 2018, I think where he had it, he had another huge September. And this is to me, Mondesi is a quad a player with, with one amazing skill and that is stealing bases because he's just not a major league hitter. Um, so once the AAA guys are rolling out there, he's rolling he's rolling out his AAA stats again. <laughs> but when you're playing them against major leaguers all season, he's not doing it. Now that's and that and that if you look at the track record, at least from this is from my memory, if you look at that at that, to me that just screams this guy he's gonna be he's gonna be platooning, he's gonna be sitting a lot or what? Because he's just he just doesn't do well when he's face in everyday competition major leaguers so it sounds like you're reaching for him <laughs> yeah i think so uh we got about 20 minutes before we're gonna close off the stream uh so i want to hit another position and then another topic and let's talk about pitchers so we i know some of us might go pocket aces other of us might go two hitters others might go one of each 
But what I'm curious as far as pitchers go, guys, are you looking for guys that are going to give you a lot of innings or are you looking for the guys that you know are just going to give you really good ratios, but they might not give you as many innings? What is as far as when you're attacking pitchers, not necessarily early on, but when you get closer to the middle of your draft, let's say we get to like the uh, the range of guys. Let's look at like Sandy Alcantara, Lucas Giolito. You go down Robbie Ray's like Robbie Ray's a perfect example of somebody, you know, you're going to get the strikeouts, but the innings, look, everything that could follow. Same with Freddie Peralta. Are, are you chasing those types of guys? Or are you chasing the guys that fall after like a, a potentially like a Lance Lynn who, you know, is just going to give you a steady production. He may not be as flashy as those guys. What is your general philosophy when you're looking at pitchers here? What do you think, Mike? Well, I think for me, you know, everything always depends on context and what league you're in. Right. So like if I'm playing in a home league, I'm not as worried about it as I am playing against sharks like you guys. And so I, I, I think what my strategy is for tomorrow, starting with TGFBI is to get the two best hitters that I possibly can in the first two rounds, and then look at uh, the innings pitched for the, my third round. So, you know, if I can get, I'm just hypothetically saying that if I can get a guy like Nola or a guy like Giolito in the third round, I feel pretty good about that, especially if I've banked, you know, banked about 50 or 60 home runs and 50 or 60 stolen bases, right. In the first couple of rounds, I'm probably not going to get that many steals in the first couple of rounds, but you get my point. Like I, I really, I feel like if you, in this type of league, if you miss out on those counting stats in the first couple of rounds, you'll never recover. Yeah. And it's like our friend Jasper says innings and K's is I think, but people are chasing the most from their starting pitchers. They want the strikeouts. They want the innings. Marty, when you're drafting and you're taking pitchers, wherever you do take them, are you going the riskier guys that might give you a lot of strikeouts? Or are you going guys that might give you a safer floor? Yeah. So the game plan is am I either the first or second round to get, you know, your standard ace. And so I will hop back in, in the land. I love this group of pitchers, Lance Lynn, Joe Musgrove, Dylan Cease, Jose Barrio, and even Charlie Morton. So I want to be able to hop back in at that time and get one of those guys. And then from there, um, I'm kind of just going to wait. And then uh, what really becomes the most important to me is the innings, is the strikeouts. I'll be less worried about ratios at that time. So you get your your first guy early on, you get your second guy in that group, and then you just find the value later on for other pitchers that you'll get. Yep. What about you, Doc? Yeah, so in the early rounds, I'm definitely going with a little bit more of the safer options. And what I think is going to be interesting is how much of an MLB season do we have? I think mm -hmm. tomorrow is the last day. If they don't get a deal done, I don't think we're having a full season. And for me, that really does downgrade pitching a little bit because they already pitch one out of every five games. They're going to be more impacted playing less games than an everyday player, a.k.a. a hitter might. So I want to go with those guys that I know are at least giving me five innings. We talked about Robbie Ray and Freddie Peralta giving you a lot of K upside, but a lot of times they hit five, six innings max because they throw so many pitches. I want those guys that are going to give me those six, seven innings, especially on a good team like Lance Lynn, get me those wins, and you just hopefully see an uptick in the Ks. Christian, you're a young guy. You also study a lot of young guys on the call-up. I'm curious, in this range right here, Trevor Rogers, Alec Manoa, Shane McClanahan, all going very close to each other, basically going within 20 picks of each other. Are you comfortable yeah. drafting these guys for TGFBI, knowing that the uncertainty that's there and at what starting pitcher is your SP2, your SP3? Where are you comfortable being as far as in your rotation? Um, well, with those three guys specifically, I'd probably feel more com most comfortable with them as my SP3. Um, cause I just generally wouldn't take them as my SP two. Like mm -hmm. I would need to have, like for me personally, I, one person that was not named, which I love this year. And I feel like he's been severely underrated is Max Freed. I love Max Freed and him. He's going around the same, um, area as like Aaron, Aaron Nola, Lance Lynn, that same, that same grouping. And I just feel like Max Freed is going to give you solid ratios across the board. Like, he's going to give you the innings. He's going to give you the strikeouts, too, which a lot of people would say he doesn't really have strikeouts, but he generates a lot of strikeouts. Um, I really do like Max Freed this year. Um, but out of those three that you named, uh, McClanahan would probably be the third on the list. Um, mm -hmm. And I think I'd go – it's tough because I love Alec Manoa and I love Trevor Rogers. Um, one of them plays for the Marlins. One of them is from Miami, so – there you go. 
but um i don't know I, they're both so good i the one thing with manoa that scares me is the the division he pitches in that's that's a tough division a lot of hitter ballparks um but with rogers we just have to see it again this season because he pitched really well and then he had the off the field stuff and then when he came back you could tell he just wasn't him so i got to i'd have to see him and that's what stinks about this the lockdown like you can't really see these guys throwing you can't really see him play so for the most part we're drafting blind mm-hmm. and that's it's not fun but um I, i'd probably take manoa would probably be my guy there and i i would take him as an sp2 oh you're trying to appease marty that's his guy I, I was going to say, there's only one correct answer. It's Alec Manoa <laughs> all day, every day. He's just a bulldog. Like, he's a that, man is built, that man is built to be, like, he's durable. He's yep. going to go out. He's going to shove it down your throat every time. Yeah. Cheesecake, there's two guys in this range. I'm also interested to hear your thoughts on Joe Musgrove, 29th pitcher off the board, and then Blake Snell and you Darvish, all going pretty much in a from 29 to 44, 15 pitchers. Are you buying the San Diego Padres? Are, are like, is there anyone specific out of that group you really like, or are you all in all three of those guys? Um, I'm in on all three. I love Darvish. I mean, I think Darvish, um, Darvish could has has the potential for a, a, a another a kind of a comeback season. Uh, he had a little bit of home run trouble, and he's going to have home run trouble. But he provides a massive amount of strikeouts. He mm-hmm. throw he threw 166 innings last year. I think he has a strong arm. He, he has a, a checkered injury history, but you know he's been throwing. He's been healthy for a few years in a row now. So I I, I feel pretty good about Darvish. Uh, Musgrove is someone who who unless you were paying attention, you didn't realize how good he was last year. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I. I think that Musgrove is someone who's getting a lot of helium. And so because of that, um, I, I'm going to be looking in his direction because th- he's around the part where I like to jump back in on pitching. I, I generally find the guys who go between like 40 and 60 have a high bust rate. And that's just based upon my memory. But if you look last year, guys like Kenta Maeda and Bla- Blake Snell went in that range. Those are the guys that people are taking chances on who might be an ace. And, and to me, that kind of 40 to 60, 40 to 70 range seems to bust a lot. Mm-hmm. So Musgrove is where I'm trying to come back in. Uh, and Snell, you know, Snell, I just, I just, I'm intrigued by a second. Yeah. Half. Like Snell is the guy, man. A very, different pitcher once he got rid of that change up. I, I, and he's, he's very cheap as according to what he could do. I think you could go worse than getting Blake Snell. What is the 44th pitcher off the board after pick a hundred? I mean, the K upside alone uh, at that point in the draft is very intriguing. Um, yeah, but, I think uh, if you're going with him as your three, you're going to – you could have a pretty nasty stack. That's what I'm mm-hmm. saying, LC. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah. what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Uh, Doc is back here. And, Doc, I, I'm sorry. I, I don't want to do this to you. But I have to bring up catchers. Yeah. Let's talk about it. And there's two catchers. Let the healing begin. Let's yeah. do it. <laughs> there's two catchers in TGFBI. For those that's their first year, you got to draft two of them. So, Doc, I'm going to ask you, what do you do as far as the catcher position? When do you take your first catcher? And then are you basically just punting your second catcher? Or are you making the effort to get a solid second guy? I, you know, I've not had a lot of success uh, in two catcher leagues just because I've never really settled on a strategy that's worked for me. Last year, I had Grandal, which was fine until he got hurt. Um, I, I, I loved what he brought to the table. I, he's going to play every day, and, and the Sox use him around the field, too. I mean, he DHs. He's also going to play some first base, it looks like, too. Uh, so I'm fine with getting you know a guy like Grandal um, as my first catcher. I would, I, I'm would i not going to pay for Sal Perez. I don't believe in Real Muto. So Will Smith I love, but I think he's going to get drafted so high that I won't be in a position to take him. Same thing with Varsho. So if I wait a little bit and take uh, Grandal, I'm fine with that. I, I, I really like Yasmani. And then I think my second guy then would be somewhere towards the middle tier. Somebody, somebody that does no harm, put it that way. So I'm fine with taking a guy like Yadi Molina. I'm, t- I'm fine with taking a guy like Omar Narvaez. I, 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 you know, I think that that's doable from my perspective. You know, once you get past like, McCann probably is probably the last guy for me where I'm like, okay, after that, it's a bit of a crapshoot. Like I know uh, Marty probably likes Eric Haas and, you know, he's going to probably play some. So, um, 
but after that, you know, look at you get Jansen is, is intriguing to an extent, but then Nola Stallings, it's like, okay, eh, they're going to play, but not going to really give you anything. Yeah. I think at this point, you're kind of starting to, to, uh, what's the expression? Grab straws. Grasping at straws. Grasping yes. at straws. Thank you. For some reason, brain is not working right now. Marty, he, uh, Doc did bring up your guy here, uh, at least plays for your team here. And Eric Haas, are you the, you're the Detroit guy. Should we be Xing him out of our second catcher? Uh, he, it scares me what they're going to do with the playing time there, you know? So with, with Haas, I mean, I like his, I mean, obviously he has really great power and that's what he showed last year. He's going to strike out a ton, but they have Tucker Barnhart who's going to be their everyday catcher. So um, he's nowhere near as sexy as far as power or anything like that. But if we're going to be talking about guys in that range, let's talk about Jorge Alvaro. Yeah. That, that's going to be let's my do- dude here from the Padres. No, 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 no. I have seen plenty of Jorge Alfaro to know that I even blindfolded. There is no way I would accidentally click on his name. Well, I actually, I actually really love him. I think he's going to be able to get you around five to eight stolen bases. Uh, well, backup catcher number one. They have they're implementing he's the, the third DH. string catcher. Hey, I'm telling you, he's going to play. He's going to play DH. He's going to play. They're going to mix him in that catcher. Isn't he their starting left fielder right now? <laughs> yes. He's, that, he's outfield exactly. eligibility. Yeah. No way, man. Yep. So I'm, I'm I, very, the this. this is a good debate. For, the Marlins traded debate. him for a player to be named later, and I'm pretty sure I heard that they would take him. They would take free soda in the clubhouse for him. Okay. You know what I'm smelling here? I'm smelling a bet. I'm going to pour up. Pull up Jorge. Well, I will say this. How many times have the Marlins traded away great talent? So, Ooh. how many times? Ooh, have away Christian, <laughs> your turn. All right. Do you know right, what's so- funny is I texted Christian last week because he's helping me with this dynasty draft that I'm in because mm-hmm. I've never done one. And I asked him about Alfaro and he was just like, no. No. no, no explanation, nothing, no. just no. It's a simple no. <laughs> what's uh, the, wait, Christian wait, has, I, I want to hear. has help in the chat too. I want to hear. Hey, that's my brother. That's why he's backing me up. There we go. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I want to. I want to hear. I want to hear some up. of the good talent that the Marlins traded away. I want to see what they're doing now. Um, so we'll stand. Christian Yelich. Christian Yelich. Yeah, he was good for MVP season after they traded him. Um, a season. I, okay. There's this one guy named Miguel Cabrera who's pretty good. So okay. Like, All right. Hold on. Like let's let's, one. let's, <laughs> let's put one. a cap on it. Let's put a cap on it this way. That's Which projection system do you guys want to use? Because there's ATC, the bad X. Let's pick a projection system. They all have them about the same. It's like 10 to 12 home runs and like 35 to 44 RBIs. Mm-hmm. Look is at that, steals. Christian, is that more than you, way more than you think he'd get? Okay. So home you want to, yeah. so I don't think, I just, first, I, I don't think he's going to get the playing time. Like that's, that's the first thing. He, you could stick him in left field. Okay. But I promise you, after an inning, uh, Bob Melvin's gonna look out there and be like, "Oh shit, <laughs> I gotta pull this guy out of there." Um, and then they have Austin Noll. Austin Noll is pretty good. And then Caratini is uh, Hugh Darvish's personal catcher, so Correct. he's not going anywhere. So yeah, good. And, good and then they have Stevens, uh, they have Campusano too. Campusano is a really good catching prospect that they have. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean they've been saying when the, it starts back up, they might trade a catcher. But so is Alfaro the guy that they trade, or is it somebody else? I think Nola. It's definitely Nola. A, yeah. I think it's Nola. I heard a joke that the Mar that somebody said the Marlins planted Francisco Cervelli in their front office just to pull Jorge Alfaro from the Marlins. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god! It's crazy. I love it. Uh, uh, Cervelli's well, still playing with how many concussions he has. Uh, the he's last not, thing I will. S- oh yeah, is, there- is he playing still? No, no, he's no. part of their front office. Oh, yeah, oh right, good. Right, yeah. Oh, good for him. Yeah. Um. The last thing I'll say is this apparently is a Omar Navarez podcast, if I remember. When we did our catcher preview, I think Marty and oh, yeah. Doc all were very much hyping him up as their guy. I think Cheesecake liked him too. So uh, very much it seems like it's a very Omar Narvaez vibe. I mean, here. it's tentatively our guy. It's just at catcher 16, I think that's good value. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm and he's gonna also he's also gonna hit like Zanino too. Mike Zanino is starting to call my name, you know, just a little bit there. <laughs> oh my god! Don't listen! Like Don't Francisco listen! <laughs> Hang up the phone. <laughs> I think Francisco Mejia is in for a big year this year. I I've been waiting for him. I would love to see him I get really like more Francisco. plate appearances. He's a really good hitter. 
Yeah, I mean, and you he's coming a lot at to get a him. huge value. Yeah, yeah, four sixteen. And I mean, yeah. if you can't make it in Tampa behind Bay, MJ Melendez, MJ Melendez, that's a whole nother discussion. I'm I'm yeah. in love with MJ Melendez. I'm I've been trying to. I think I have him in every draft I've done over the last month. I've ha- I've grabbed him. You guys got uh, any love for Jonah Heim? Uh, um, I think they got Heim in the tr- in a trade with Oakland a few years ago, and and he's been kind of their next catcher up. I think Trevino is a pretty good catcher, mm-hmm. so I like think he's going to be. Sam Huff is going to play yeah. first, though, isn't he? I think no. Huff's going to be playing some first base L- this year. Low is going to play first. Um, yeah. I think Huff is multi-position eligible at first right now, if I'm not mistaken. He, he was catching somebody the other day on Twitter. I saw. I don't remember is that who right. It was. Maybe I'm maybe maybe my my information's mistaken. I like Huff's power. He's another one of these high strikeout, high power guys. So I mean. But, uh, you know, I, I think Trevino or Heim, I think they're going to hold it down. But Huff got a small cup of, cup of water in 2020, I think, and did not do very well. And I don't know what to make of that. It was just a short look up. But, uh, but uh, so, I mean, I, I'm waiting for them to give him another chance. I almost drafted him last year, actually. What do you guys think of Luis Torrens? I like Kyle Riley a lot. The, Torrens is not going to play catcher, but he is going to play. So I think he's he's one one of these catchers that plays other positions, um, and they're going to give him looks in, in other positions as well. He's a really good hitter. Yeah, I think it's it's going to be a not a bad look if you grab him late. I mean, it doesn't cost a lot to get either. So a lot of these guys you can just use it towards the end of your draft. I believe is it TGFBI twenty six rounds thirty. Oh, it's 30. 30, 30 okay. rounds. Yeah, yeah. So. so there will be if anybody that does DC fifties, the player pool that's going to be left over is a lot bigger then you're going to realize. So there's going to be a lot of guys you can grab later on off the waiver wire. Uh, but we're going to we're gonna finish the show by 8 o'clock. So I want to go around real quick, and everybody gets a chance to plug whatever you're doing as well. But, Doc, give us your one biggest piece of advice for first-year drafters, and then plug all the great stuff you're doing. Well, here's the thing that I would say that I learned the most, is that don't be – you're going to be surrounded by a lot of big names in your draft, people that are really well-known in the field. And – Don't be like me last year and be intimidated by that. There's still people just the same as you or I are. Stick to your plan, pivot when you need to, but don't be afraid and don't reach for stupid things like I did last year, like Jared Kalinich in the 11th round. (laughs) (laughs) I I think it's very much, you you want to make your your mark. This is especially for people who are doing it for the first time with all these big name people. You're, You're like, I want to be in the leaderboards. I want to do, you know, I want to be the best person out there. And so just, yeah, like, like Doc said, just don't be intimidated, go and do you don't, you know, if you're going to make gambles, make sure you're owning it. It's not because somebody else told you to do it. Uh, Christian, same thing for you. This is your first year doing it. So maybe you can explain yeah. your, your mindset going into it. And then obviously plug all the great stuff you're doing too. Uh, mindset is just like I said, I'm, I'm going in there. I'm just going to have a ton of fun doing it. Like this is something that I've always wanted to do for a long time. And when I got that email, you know, welcoming in, me into it, I that was crazy. Like something so small like that. I, I cherish the little things. So I'm going into it. I'm just going to enjoy it. Um, I'm going in with, like I said, the first round, I have three guys that I'm looking at. And after that, I'm just going to try to get a feel for the board, see how everybody mm-hmm. else is drafting, how they're approaching it, and then go from there. Um, for the most part, I'm going to try to go the same um, way I did in our draft. Because I like the way that I approached it. I I went contrary to what I said I was going to do in this one, which is two hitters. But um, I went pitcher, uh, hitter, pitcher. And then after that, I got a good feel for it. And I was able to get really good value later on in the draft. And that's kind of what I'm going to be going for now. Well, you both are very humble because you both didn't plug anything either. Doc, just please, oh, please let us know also where they can where they can find you. Uh, you can find me right now at Fantrax and at SP Streamer and at Nine Any Know It All and at MDRC zero five zero eight uh, on the Twitterverse. And Christian, tell everybody. I, everybody knows that you from Triple Play, but the other stuff that you're doing too. Go ahead and throw yeah. that out there. Um, so I recently was brought on by Pitcher List, and I'm going to be writing for them now. Um, awesome. I also write for Fantasy Pros. I write for Dynasty Nerds. 
I have uh, my wonderful co-host on the call up right above me on the screen and Marty. We recorded another episode today. Got a lot of other really good ones coming up. Um, yeah, just just having fun, just enjoying life. It's love to hear that. And yeah, the call up is becoming one of the best prospect videos it, on it, YouTube. I'm having so much fun. Doing yeah, that. it's awesome for sure. I look forward to every single episode that we record. Yeah, and the guests you guys are bringing in too. Like, I know there's some good ones coming that you guys Ooh, haven't said right. yet. So that that'll be the that's gonna three, be the next three coming up. Oh my goodness gracious! And the changers. best part about it is they came up with that name first. That's yep. right. You guys had someone in your corner calling that. <laughs> uh, really quick, cheesecake <laughs> doc Marty. I, I want to get Marty out by eight o'clock for American Idol. Yep. So, thank you. Oh lord. <laughs> <laughs> so Elsie, that's a warning. Elsie, give us quickly your advice. <laughs> Track your draft. Make sure you know uh, which way you want to go with your picks. Track your draft. Use a spreadsheet. Use some software. Uh, know what statistics you're lacking in from your draft. Don't leave too much to to, uh, to pickups in season because you're not going to be guaranteed to get your guys. Um, just make sure that you are on top of the player pool and uh, and on top of, of tracking where you're going in your draft and know which direction you want to go. Love it. Doc. Um, after the first few rounds, don't pay attention to ADP. If you really feel strongly about someone, then take that person because you're going to have a lot of regret if you choose someone else because you think you can get that person on the way back. Get your guy. Great All advice. Right. I like it. And Marty, close us out. Well, my number one best advice is obviously to draft uh, Jorge Alfaro. I make sure you do that. Um, <laughs> Kick them off the street. <laughs> but but no, uh, be consistent. Remember, this is, I mean, in, in theory, we're going to have a decent size season, whether that's 162 or 140, whatever it is. Get Prepare for fab. You know, read Roto Guts, read Vlad's stuff, you know, Sunday morning. Prepare each week because you're going to have the opportunity to outsmart everyone in your league each week. Mm -hmm. You don't rest on anything. And shout out to Mike Carter because I actually get to meet him in real life March 12th for our Glarf League in Chicago. So I'm super excited. Hey. I get to shake the man's hand. It's going to be exciting. Oh, I'm jealous. And uh, shout out Jasper. Thanks Love for hanging out with us on the stream. You're going to um, have to drink some Malort though, Marty. It's, 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 it's a Chicago rite of passage. I, was, I don't even know what that is, but you gotta, right, you're going to know. <laughs> you got to video call us and I'll do the same even know with that the means. turf draft. <laughs> <That's provocative>. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, on that note, I don't know how I can transition from that, but on, the, <laughs> on that note, guys, thanks everybody for tuning in to the live stream. Enjoy your TGFBI drafts tomorrow. It's going to be a blast, and you'll see the normal triple play crew coming at you this Thursday evening going to our shortstop preview, and you'll see more call-up stuff coming, of course, from the two men in the middle there. Oh, so yeah. see you guys, everybody. I don't even know how to transition. See you guys next time. We'll catch you. Make then. like a bread truck and haul these buns. That's yeah. what it is. Right? Yeah. There it is. Oh, man. There it is. <laughs> <laughs>